and one, and here we are. It is episode number eight of the Catamount Chronicles, our UVM-centered podcast. I'm your host, Brady Farkas. A fitting end to our first full month here of episodes. We started with Tom Brennan. We leave with one of Tom Brennan's disciples. It's TJ Sorrentine. TJ, how are you, man? I'm great, brother. Uh, slow motion over here. Just uh, you know, taking it day by day, and um, you know, seeing what they throw at us, and getting ready for the fall. Well, I appreciate you joining me, and the, the podcast is always brought to you by Sobu Stretch Boutique Yoga and Meditation Studio off Shelburne Road in South Burlington, and by the Strike Zone Academy Baseball Facility in Essex Junction off Susie Wilson Road. So we'll tell you more about them as we go. TJ, um, we've talked a bunch of times, but this is going to afford us a time to talk for uh, longer than we usually get to. So there's some things I want to ask you that I've never been able to ask you, so I'm glad that you're with us now. One thing that I did not know about you, or maybe I knew and I didn't remember, is that the first year that UVM won the America East Championship, you were out for the entire season with an injury. I did not know that. I did not remember that vividly about you. What was it like for you as the program is ascending and getting really, really good to be a part of it but not be on the court and be a part of it? Yeah, it was uh, it was really hard. Um, you know, the previous year we had um, lost in the semifinals, um, and now we had won the league, the, the regular season championship, and then we lost in the semifinals to Maine. And it was a it was a heartbreaker of a loss. Um, and then the following year, you know, we expected big things, and um, unfortunately, it broke my wrists um, in a preseason scrimmage, uh, the green and gold scrimmage. One of my teammates, good friend to this day, Scotty Jones, undercut me when I went up for a layup and um, broke both my wrists. And um, yeah, we struggled that year to um, to start, and and the expectation was that I was going to come back after Christmas, and I, I I'll never forget. I came back um, Christmas, I think it was Christmas Eve night or Christmas night. Um, I had taken the bus back to Burlington because um, I didn't have my license, yep. and uh, so my parents threw me on the bus, and um, I, I walked in the coach's office, and I said, ah, I'm not going to come back, and I think he was shocked. Like he kind of looked at me like, what? And um, I'm like, yeah, I, you know, I missed 16, 17 games. Like I want, I came here to play four years. I want to play all my games. And um, I, I don't, I didn't want, I don't want to give up those games. And I, I, he, I don't think he was happy with me at the time, um, <laughs> but I, I had talked with my, my parents about it. And, um, you know, I felt like a year off could really benefit me um, if I trained the right way. Um, you know, obviously I felt like I was letting my teammates down, but I, I didn't think I was going to be the player I needed to be to, to help us win. And, I think it actually helped us in the long run. It gave us some closure that I wasn't going to come back. And those guys, man, they played a heck of a league season and, and obviously won the title without me. So, uh, But it was hard, um, but I was super happy for those guys, man, especially the seniors. They they played so hard and so well. It was uh, that, that game against BU is something I'll never forget. That was an awesome feeling just being a part of it. So the Soren team from the parking lot, Syracuse win. That doesn't have – you're not there if you come back that season, right? Yeah, not there, not there. Uh, you know, they. A lot of people say everything happens for a reason, um, and uh, I think that was that was the reason that part that uh, that game against Syracuse in that year was a special year for us, and it wouldn't have happened if I came back. Um, so the stars aligned, and uh, but it was uh, yeah, it was unfortunate, but uh, it was it was good to just experience it and see you know going to Salt Lake and uh, being a part of that and being able to watch it. You know, you know, it was gave me some some valuable experience for sure. You're the associate head coach at Brown, so we'll talk about your coaching um, desires, aspirations in your career here momentarily. Um, you as a coach know how hard it is to see teams and programs that stay really good. It's also really hard to get good. So what was it like being a part of the Tom Brennan-led teams that really changed the culture of the program here in Burlington? Yeah, so when I when I got there as a freshman, the previous year they were good. Um, you know, they had Tony Osiari, Toby Carberry, Dave Roach, Craig Peeper. Like that was a good team, um, and they I think they won seventeen games that year. And the league was much different. Like my freshman year, we had Hofstra, Drexel, Delaware, Townsend. Um, you know, along with Northeastern and BU, and the team was the the league was very very difficult, and uh, we struggled my freshman year. So like they went from a good team um to we only won nine games that year and we were in the playing game against unh um in the conference tournament so it was it was hard for me because i had you know won two state titles and um i expected to come in there and win right away and i and that was that was one of the reasons i went there to vermont was to get to the NCAA tournament um and to not have success was hard um but ultimately it brought us together 
um, and, and, and helped us become successful my sophomore year and eventually win the league and, and go on to do some great things. But um, I think that first year was, was a growing experience. And, you know, when you have a freshman point guard and that's, that was one of the big reasons I went there, you know, coach said he was going to give me the ball for 35 minutes as a freshman. I really didn't believe it at the time. Um, but, you know, you're obviously going to have some learning and, and drop off, especially from the previous year with giving the fresh a freshman the ball. So um, I think it was uh, a learning experience for sure. You know, I've heard you talk about what you were like while you were in college. I've heard Brennan in the way that only Brennan can talk about what you were like. What were you truly like as a freshman? I mean, what was college young TJ Sorrentine like? Because, like, I have this vision of what I think you were based on what everyone said, but I'd love to hear it again from you. Yeah, I wasn't the most likable guy. Um, I was kind of to myself. Um, you know, I would I dress funny and talk funny, and as as you probably heard from coach, and uh, I just just kind of how I had a vision of just just I could do it almost on my own. Um, and I was very locked into being a successful basketball player, almost too much to a fault. Um, and that's kind of one thing. You know, I learned and, and helped me become successful is learning that you can't do it on your own. Um, and I think that first year really helped me. And a guy, Tony Osiari, who was an all-conference player, he kind of took me under his wing. And he taught me a lot that year um, about, you know, being a good teammate and, and interacting with guys off the floor. Um, and, and you have to do different things to be a great leader. And, and you know, I always – pride in myself in being a great leader, but I wasn't being a great leader as a freshman just because I was I didn't know how to be. And so I owe a lot of my success to him. Um and I haven't really never even told him that, but he 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 taught me a lot that year and uh, ultimately, you know, he was a big influence in me. You know, it's something that's I've told almost every guest that I've had this question. It's become my favorite question. So I'm gonna ask you and the answer might be different now than it was when you were playing. Would you rather be the guy on a team that isn't as good or supplemental eighth guy, 12 minutes a game on a team that's really good. What would you like, like what role would be better for you? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's always hard to box yourself into a role. Um, obviously you want uh, the most important thing is winning. Uh, that, that is by far the most important thing. And, and, you know, as a coach now, just getting, our guys to buy in to playing a role, but also not boxing them in just to be be that role player. We always yeah. strive to teach these guys to, to be more and be better and continue to work on your game and develop. Um, but, you know, it, it's all about winning. Um, and I think that's the balance, you know, because everybody comes out of high school um, to division one and they, you know, they they were a star for the most part. Um, in their town, on their high school team, at their prep school. So it's hard to get to, to mesh these guys together. And that was why we were so good. Jermaine Mopajila, David yep. Hain, you know, those guys allowed me and Taylor to be the stars. Um, and, and they were stars. Like David Hain was, he was the best player in Ontario. You know, he averaged 27 a game. You know, he, he never got 27 in one game, uh, you know, at Vermont. So like, those guys, you know, allowed us to be successful. And um, that's, it's hard. That's hard. You know, uh, like Alex Jensen, he scored over 3000 points at, at in Connecticut. He was all time leading scorer in Connecticut. And he came to Vermont, he transferred in from Lehigh and, you know, where he started as a freshman and, you know, he, he was successful. Um, you know, he was, and now he got hurt, but he was a role player for us. And, and I'm sure he would have loved to play more minutes, but, like he knew his role and he was, he was like a coach off the floor for us. And, you know, it's, that's the, that's the, uh, the balance of it. But obviously the end all be all is winning. I think anybody will tell you that going to the NCAA tournament, I saw you on here with Mike Tromboli and yeah. um, I'm sure, I'm sure he would give up, um, you know, all his points and all his assists um, to, to get to the NCAA tournament and play in the NCAA tournament. Now he had a lot of success, um, just didn't get there, but I'm sure he'd give it all back just to play in the NCAA tournament. You know, I coached junior college baseball for two years and division three baseball for one. And when I was going through it, I was like, how did my coaches do this growing up? Cause I looked at all the personalities on the team and I'm like, damn, this is hard. And I'm like, were we like this? Was I like this growing up? I'm like, I have a newfound, I have a new appreciation for coaching after going through it. Do you ever look back at yourself and wonder like, how did my coaches do this? 
Yeah. Um, just being in it. Um, yeah. I asked myself that, you know, uh, just the personalities and, and how you mesh with different guys and, you know, recruiting the, the right type of guys. I think that's the biggest thing, um, especially at a place like Vermont. I think Coach Becker, that's where he's excelled. And, and obviously Coach Blicky and Ryan Schneider, who I've played, who I played with, you know, those guys have been there for a while. Like they just get the guys that fit the right, the right system, the way they play and they fit in the culture, they fit uh, on campus. Um, like all that stuff is so important. Um, you know, it just can't be just a fit on the basketball court. It has to be all rolled in one, especially today with, with the transfers and, you know, guys leaving school. It, it's uh, a lot of that stuff comes into play, but more so now, I think than, than ever. You won multiple state championships, as you alluded to, in high school in Rhode Island. Your dad was your head coach going through high school. I got to imagine, on one hand, that's incredibly rewarding and fun, and on one hand, it was incredibly tough at other times. What was that dynamic like of playing for your dad? Yeah, I hated him. Uh, yeah. It was the worst four, worst four years of my life, uh, <laughs> honestly. Um, he, mm. you know, actually, I had three years. I didn't play varsity as a freshman, um, and then, you know, I, it was the worst worst three years of my life uh he's my best friend to this day um i owe him everything but for those three years um it was terrible i remember one i'll give you one specific story we we beat la salle academy which on the road which was a big catholic school rivalry i had 27 points and um but i i had went to my friend's house the other best player on our team and uh, before the game i didn't ride the bus with him and he drove the bus to the games so okay so like imagine we had to drive to school with him, drive on the bus with him to games, and then drive home with him on the bus, yeah. and then hop in his car and then drive home. So I was with him all the time. So he was mad that I didn't get to the game um, before halftime of the JV game, and yep. he didn't say anything at the time. Didn't you know? No, no issues. I had twenty seven. We win. Uh, I I jump on the bus <laughs> uh, home. I'm the only one taking the bus home uh, back to the school. Everyone else, you know, uh, hopped hopped the ride, and um, so. He got in my rear end. He, he just, who do you think you are? Blah, you know, and I just had 27. I'm only a junior in, in high school. And, you know, and then we get home and uh, he says, uh, take out the trash. That's all you ever be is a garbage man. <laughs> so wow. that didn't go over well with me, me having a little attitude. One thing led to another. And uh, before you know it, uh, I'm up against the house. My mother's sprinting outside, put him down. And it's just, <laughs> and the, the next morning, I got to sit down and eat breakfast with the guy. And yeah. I'm telling him, I'm out. I'm leaving. I'm transferring. I'm out. I'm not going. Uh, you know, it's just, just that was one of many stories. But um, it, it, that ultimately toughened me up, uh, gave me tough skin, and, and allowed me to be successful. Um, just the way he taught me, loved me, um, and, um, you know, made me the, the, the person I am today. How, so how long was your dad, the high school coach at your school for? Uh, for, I think he ended at 40 years. Okay. So, so you knew this situation was coming, like, and he knew it was coming for a long time and you were all able to, able to prepare for it. Did you ever think about not going there in the first place and just never playing for it? I was never a choice. Um, I, I, it was always I was going to go to St. St. Raphael Academy, and I always wanted to go. Um, yeah. I, I don't think either of us knew the dynamic, and I was a big personality too. Like my brother came in after me and played for my dad, and uh, but my brother was different than me. He he didn't. He, we had different personalities, so he didn't he didn't um, butt heads with my dad as much as I did. I'm sure my dad learned a lot from coaching me. Um, but they didn't have the relationship that me and my dad had when we played, uh, when I played for him. So, um, yeah, there was never, never a thought to leave or, you know, I had obviously a couple instances like I, one I just shared, yeah. but I, I, I seriously, I was never going to go anywhere else, <laughs> but, but play for him. So. The one thing I've always wanted to ask you is, and the picture that's been painted is that you and Taylor Coppenrath were incredibly different people, um, especially at the times when you got to UVM. And you're forever going to be linked because of that team and those teams you played on. But how close actually are you? Yeah, we were we were we were really close. Um, our like sophomore, second, uh, both our junior years, and then our senior year. I mean, we lived together, and so yeah. we lived together for you know four years. Um, so we were super close, and 
and we, obviously different, but we, we'd hang out all the time and we had a great relationship. And, um, I think like any, anything, when you, when you leave college, your relationship wanes a little bit. Like, I, I mean, when I see him, it's like, you know, we, we don't miss a beat. And that's the same with, with all those guys, with David Hain and Jermaine Mopajula and Alex Jensen, you know, those guys are, you know, my brothers for life. And, um, but you just, you know, your relationship is different now, but I, I would say when we played, we were, you know, we we're tight as can be, uh, just, but that was our team. That was our team yeah. dynamic. We knew we didn't have a chance to beat Northeastern or, you know, these teams with a lot of talent, uh, if we weren't close on the court and off the court. And that's one thing I did learn from, as I spoke earlier, early in my career from, uh, Tony OCR. So what's the Sorrentine cop and Ralph has, what's the Sorrentine cop and Rath house? Like when you're growing up, there's a lot of PS two, what board games, what are you guys playing in the, uh, early 2000s what are you guys doing yeah we would uh we were we would play some video games um you know just hanging out we were uh you know we'd always have people over um that was a big thing we played a lot of poker especially that yeah. my senior year um, world series poker of poker was, texas hold'em was going big then it was really really big in 2005 and and we used to have these house games and um that was our thing we really didn't go out a ton we weren't a big you know I, it was one of my things like during the season i wasn't into partying and you know was totally focused and so like one of the ways to keep the focus was to kind of have people over and play poker and yeah. uh you know, we had a, we had some some epic nights, and uh, it was a lot a lot of fun. We had the freshmen over a lot, and um, you know, it was those are some fun fun nights. What was it like for you? It's 2019, last year, last October. You came back, coached for Brown against UVM in an exhibition game. You get your number retired with Taylor there. What was that night like for you? What did it mean to you? Yeah, it was awesome. It was. Uh, you know, a special, special night. I think, you know, the best part for me is my family being able to to see it, like my daughters and uh, my daughter's five. And so she'll remember that she has a jersey, yeah. my 11 jersey, and she, she wears it every once in a while. And <laughs> whenever she sees the, the V sign and we go back and visit my wife's family, you know, she she remembers that night and talks about it. And so for me, that's that's the best part, you know, with my parents being able to relive the, those memories and see the copper wrath. You know, his parents um, see the Haynes and, you know, just talk about the memories and the good times we had. That was the other thing. Like our parents, all the parents, all our senior parents were like super tight, too. So like we, we had like a, a awesome dynamic and uh, it was just something to me. That's the best part. Just being able to relive those times and memories with the people uh, that you made them with. So that well, of- it, it was awesome. One of my favorite memories of that time was we had Gus Johnson on the radio like the day of or the day before that ceremony happened, and he vividly recalled your, called that game against Syracuse, recalled the Soren team from the parking lot shot, talked about Brennan's arms up in the air. Like tw- 15 years later, it still burns in his mind like it burns in yours and it burns in people's crowd. You've talked about the Gus Johnson call before, but when you hear that, what, what does that mean to you when you hear Gus Johnson? Soren team from the parking lot. Yeah, it's cool, man. He's a, he's a legend. So, you know, when he, when he still remembers it vividly as, as he says, um, that it's special, you know, it's, uh, it it makes you realize how, why it has, uh, you know, held its fever for this long, you know, it's, um, the call made the shot. I think, you know, I always say that like, it was a great shot, but if Gus Johnson isn't the one on the call, I don't think it lives as long as it's lived, uh, to be honest. So I, I kind of owe a lot to him, uh, for, uh, for making that call, um, on the shot. The uh, Catamount Chronicles is episode number eight with TJ Sorrentine is brought to you by Sobu Stretch Boutique Yoga Meditation Studio off Shelburne Road in South Burlington. My guys, Scott and Erica, they are the ones that own it, operate it. They do everything safe following CDC guidelines, social distancing, small classes, three to five people. Virtual options are there. You can follow them on Facebook and they use the promo code Brady5 to get $5 off. You'll see it flashing on the screen there below you. So you get $5 off with the promo code Brady5. Going up until that game against Syracuse, did you believe that you could win? Like, what's it like? You're a 13 taking on a four. What's it like for you week of the game leading up to it? Yeah, I mean, I was a confident, cocky guy at that time. And, and we were uh, we were good, and, and we felt we were good. And having played in the tournament a couple of years, that, that was huge for us. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we, we 100% we knew we, we could win and no disrespect to Syracuse, but we were just we were just worried about ourselves and 
think more people than us were worried about Syracuse in the matchup. Yeah. Uh, we would, we were just worried about ourselves and we knew we were good enough to kind of beat anybody. We had played Kansas and North Carolina who were both one seeds. North Carolina ended up winning the title that year. So we had played both those teams uh, this that year. So we had played the best. So we knew, we knew we could compete with anybody. And um, yeah, it was, it was, it was a fun week. Always that NCAA tournament week, man. I try to tell our guys all the time guys I've coached that like, you can't, you can't make that stuff up. It, it's the best feeling in the world. Just, knowing you know you're going to the tournament and selection sunday but that week leading up to the game is awesome you know it's so much fun how interesting was the dynamic that entire year because you have all the expectations you taylor are a senior but brennan's leaving and they from what i've been told it's known that he's leaving at this point so there's kind of this like one last dance thing for him going on what are, what's the dynamic like that year yeah crazy dynamic um you know, some book worthy dynamic, yeah. um, you know, just because he announces it, you know, in the fall and then Jesse Eagle, who is the associate head coach had been there so long, he doesn't get the job mid season. So yeah. it it's, you know, and he, he is like the, the, the brains behind the operation as far as, you know, running the offense and, you know, a lot in timeouts having the board. And um, so, it was really hard for him not, and for anybody, I, can, I just can't imagine that happening. Um, and, you know, for him not to get the job and they, they give it to somebody else, um, you know, during the season was, you know, I remember even we, we had to like uh, meet with candidates during the year, um, wow. w- which was, which was very unique. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, it was, a, a, you know, cause then, you know, he's mad because he didn't get the job. And then it's, why didn't he get the job? And we're kind of like, you know, this is our coach. And, you know, we, we obviously want him to get the job. And, yeah. Um, but again, it was, it was, yeah, it was, it was some wild times and some rocky times. And, um, you know, we, being a veteran group uh, of seniors, um, that helped us. Like if we were sophomores and that was going on, um, I think it would have been really hard for us to, to maintain and, and be successful. Like we had, we were experienced. We knew what we needed to do. Uh, the outside noise, any distraction was not gonna, you know, take us away from our goal. Um, so, but it was hard. It was, it was unique, um, unique experience for sure. You know, you hit the shot against Syracuse, and everybody always wants to talk about that. And, yeah, that's what you're known for. But you were also Rookie of the Year in the conference, Player of the Year in the conference, multi-time America East selection. Uh, do you ever wish people would stop talking about it? Because you're not a one-hit wonder, TJ. Like, you had other things that were great about your career. It's funny, yeah. You know, I, I bust our guys' balls all the time, you know, my players now. and You know, they'll bust my chops. Coach, you just made one shot. That's mm. all you made. You know, and I, Say Google, man. Google. You, you, <laughs> they didn't have Google when I was playing. Now Google, just Google me. Um, and and uh, it's funny, yeah. I mean, I again, I I'd rather be known for making that shot than than anything. Um, yeah. You know, but uh, yeah, I could play a little bit. You know, I wasn't <laughs> wasn't a one hit wonder. <laughs> now you played overseas for a couple of years. Um, I had the list in front of me a little while ago. I forget all the places that they were, but you went over and played um, in Europe for a bit, a couple of seasons. When did you know that you wanted to come back and maybe get into coaching or just didn't want to be over there anymore? Yeah, no, I, it, it, I didn't. Um, I, what happened was uh, after my, my first year, I played in Italy, and then I came home um, probably the end of January and then went to the G League. Um, oh, that's I right. In, yes. I, yeah, I played in the G League, and I uh, was in uh, Florida. Um, yes. And played for the Florida Flame, and, and it was like two games left in the season. I tore my ACL. Um, so I ended up having a rehab uh, for like seven months, and then I went to Portugal, um, played that year, and then I went to Slovenia and had a great year. It was my best year overseas, um, and I, I signed a, 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 you know, the most lucrative deal I, I had up, up until that point, and um, I was ready to go go back, and we were in the playoffs and the semifinals, and and I hurt my knee um, hmm. and I came home and I was fine. I was working out. I was, you know, running at the track, at, um, you know, after I'd taken a, a couple of weeks off and, uh, and it just, something just didn't feel right in my knee, but mind you, I was still working out. I was playing. So I went and got an MRI and I had a small tear in my ACL. Um, so then I had a choice. Uh, Jesse Ago got the Brown job. 
um, and he offered me an assistant coaching spot. Um, but I had already signed to go back to play. Um, yeah. And it was a, a, a lucrative deal. And um, I had a decision and I talked to a lot of people and they said, if you want to coach, you have to take this position because the longer you play, the further you are out, it's harder to get into coaching. Uh, so ultimately I made that decision that uh, it was my time. This is what I wanted to do for my life. Um, as much as I love playing, I had to rehab again another six, seven months. Uh, would have been really hard for me. I would have had to do it in Europe. Um, if they would have let me do it at home, I might've thought about it a little more, but, uh, not be, being in Europe and not playing would have been really hard for me. So, uh, and knowing and talking to a lot of people and people I trust, uh, you know, telling me that, you know, if, if I have this opportunity to coach in division one and get on the road and recruit, um, I need to do it. Um, and, uh, you know, thankfully, you know, that's what I did because I, I love what I do now for sure. So you're at Brown now. You've been there for a while, associate head coach. The Ivy League was at the forefront of canceling things back in March, getting rid of the conference tournament. How difficult has this offseason been, I guess, these last five months been for you as a coach? I imagine recruiting's been tough. Connecting with current players has been tough. Altered campus life has been tough. What's it been like for you? Yeah, it's 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 been a, um, it's been a unique thing, man. These... You know, just I, I think it's it's helped. Uh, you know, we're I try to pride myself on relationships and being close with my players, and I think that's the biggest part in developing players is having a relationship with them and having them trust you. If they don't trust you, you're not going to be able to develop them at the highest level. Um, so, for me, it's even getting deeper into the relationship with these guys. Yeah. Uh, I probably talk to these guys more now um, than I would have throughout the spring, um, and then throughout this summer, just trying to, because we missed the spring time with them. So the communication aspect with the players has been so much ramp, you know, usually we give them the summer, you know, we let them, you know, you don't want your college coach calling you every, yeah. every other day in the summer, you know, um, at least I didn't uh, as much as I love TV. I didn't want to <laughs> call me all the time. Um, but uh, yeah, I think from a relationship standpoint and then with everything going on in the world, um, it, it's, you know, dealing with our guys and their feelings about certain things. And, um, that's been, that's been eye opening and lightning, um, to have these conversations with guys. Uh, but it has been unique, you know, obviously you mentioned the recruiting aspect of it. Um, you know, you, you normally we running around watching these guys play. So we have stuff to talk about with them. Um, you know, you kind of, you lose that aspect of it, you know, as much as you can watch them film, it's, it's different than seeing them in person and, uh, it's been a challenge, but uh, it, it's helped helped me grow, and a lot of the guys in the profession that I'm friendly with, you know, it's it's helped them as well. How has it helped being at Brown? How has it helped you evolve? Because you talk about you as a player being singularly focused. I picture you as a gym rat. When you're in the Ivy League, it's not that they're not focused on basketball because they are, but they're focused on a lot of other things also. Um, and basketball might not be somebody's 100% of their time focused. So how have you had to kind of change your mindset based on the guys that you're currently around in coaching and recruiting, et cetera? Yeah, just, uh, and I always say, like, I wish I had a little more balance when I went to school. So I think that's helped me coaching. Um, these guys have balance. Um, yeah. And it's it, coming to an Ivy League school is a special opportunity. It puts you in a, a different category than a lot of a lot of people in the world. Um, and I think that it's helped me realize that, um, that it's not, you know, as much as I love basketball and love the game, I've learned so much more outside of the game um, and how to deal with certain certain personalities and different people um uh, you know it's brown has afforded me the opportunity to meet some unbelievable people and interact with uh some 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 smart intelligent uh people successful and uh it's helped me grow so from a selfish standpoint it's it, you know i don't know where i would be if i was anywhere else um you know it's it's just kind of helped me from that aspect and uh you know i owe a lot to Coach Agle and Coach Martin, the guy I work for now, and um, it's uh, it's been an eye opening uh, experience for me. And I, the reason I people say I can't believe you're still there, I love what I do. I coach great kids. Um, I, I I continue to learn, um, and, and you know when that stops, uh, that that's when I would I would move or leave or or give it up, you know, because I think that's that's the key. You got to just keep continuing to learn and grow and get better. 
Catamount Chronicles episode number eight brought to you by the Strike Zone Academy in Essex Junction baseball training facility. They've got all the latest and all the tech stuff from your Rapsodo and your hit tracks to as simple as rent out the batting cage, bring your buddies in for a birthday party. So get a free evaluation of your baseball skills by mentioning this podcast. Say that you heard about it from Brady on the Catamount Chronicles. It's off Susie Wilson Road in Essex. It's an awesome place. I've given lessons there. I've been in there. It is great for everything that the baseball player in your life needs. Um, w- look, this is going to come out probably two weeks after we tape it, so the answer could always change. But where are we at right now? Ivy League is done through January 1st, right? Nothing's happening for you guys until January 1st. Do we know any idea about what happens on January 1st yet? We don't, unfortunately. I, I can speculate. Um, you know, hopefully – the thought for us is to get our, you know, get our kids back on campus, uh, you know, after Christmas as soon as possible. And then hopefully league play can start, um, you know, within a couple of weeks, I would probably say they would give us two to three weeks to practice. And, yep. um, and then, you know, hopefully we can figure out a way to, you know, get these games in. Um, it's, it's hard. Uh, you see a lot of different spec, a lot of the speculation and talk, uh, about different conferences and the bubbles. I think the proven thing is the bubbles work. Uh, yep. You know, I think that's proven. I think baseball, you know, with the positive tests, it's it's been tough at times. Uh, I'll be interested to see how football fares. Uh, but the bubble works. Um, I think hot, the, the highest level conferences um, may be able to, to do that and afford that. I don't know right now how the mid and lows as far as conferences would be able to pull that off. Um, it, it, I'm just, I, I hope it can happen. Uh, I think there is going to be an NCAA tournament. I do, I do feel that way. Um, I don't know how the mids and lows get there, um, whether we just have a conference tournament or to get in the tournament, or we figure out a way to have, uh, you know, ha- have, have different pods of games where we can play you know, three or four games in a weekend or, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday or something like that. Um, I'm hopeful. I'm optimistic. That's just who I am as a person. Uh, But, you know, the not knowing is the hardest part, you know, especially for us and our players, Uh, you know, just not being able to answer questions uh, to them, you know, giving them, uh, you know, exact information to what's, what's going to happen. So it's been hard, but I'm optimistic. I'm hopeful and hopefully things can uh, keep continue to get better. I'll get you out of here on two quicker ones. How qu- how many years in advance does scheduling get done? Because UVM every year, we got Ivy Leagues on the schedule, right? Harvard a lot, Yale a lot, Dartmouth every year. When can we get Brown on the schedule? Like, if we schedule it now, do we get it in, like, 2025? How far out we got to go? Yeah, just a couple of years. Uh, we've talked about it. We've tried that. We actually tried to um, work on something this year. Uh, it was a little late. Um, just as far as dates wise, um, that's the biggest thing, just finding a date that works for both schools. Um, but it's usually two years out. You know, I think that's, that's as far as we go. Um, most mid to lows will go and, you know, every year you're trying to get the best guarantee games, the most money, uh, for your program. I think we rely on that, 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 that money. And, um, so yeah, we'll, we'll work on it. Hopefully we can get it done, uh, sooner rather than later. All right, last question. One of my, another one of my favorite questions. It's just you. You don't have to worry about the kids aren't there. Your wife's not there. It's just you in Burlington. Where are you going to eat? You can pig out anywhere you want. Where are you going to eat? You know, it's funny. My wife lives up there, and um, you know, I always say I, that I got to get to this place. I got to get to this place, um, and I never get there. We very. She, her family lives in Colchester, so it's a little a little ways out. But I just we never really ventured downtown. Um, but, uh, Reuben James, RJ's the wings. Yes. I used to love the wings there, man. And every time I go up to them, like, I got to sneak out and go to RJ's just for some wings. Like I just, man, those things were so good. And you know how, when you're younger, sometimes the food tastes different when you're older. Yeah. So I, I almost want to like run it back and see if they're actually that good or I was just young and naive and, um, you know, I didn't have a, as good a palate as I have now, but um, yeah, some uh, sooner rather than later, I'm going to get back there. But Reuben James wings, mild wings with uh, w- with some blue cheese dressing. I'm only like I'm 30. I'm a few years younger than you, but I'm not 20 either. Um, I'm telling you, they're still good. They're still oh, very yeah. good. I love so. it. I love it. I got to get there then. 
TJ, man, I appreciate it. All thanks to the Strike Zone Academy in Essex Junction, Sobu Stretch uh, Yoga and Booty or Yoga Studio, Meditation Studio in South Burlington. TJ, man, this is awesome. I appreciate it. Good luck to Brown this year, and uh, we'll root for the best college hoop season we can. We'll be rooting for you. Thanks, brother. I appreciate you having me on.